we're going to be going over the classification notebook and in order to access the classification site to help you get the answers in a little bit more depth than what I'm going to be going over, um, I click on the frog to get started and go to the page. So let's go on to slide two. You had all these big words over here on the right side and what you had to do was click and drag them into this Venn diagram and you're going to tell me which of these words um, describes a prokaryotic cell, a eukaryotic cell, or both. So, a prokaryotic cell has no membrane-bound organelles, it has no nucleus, and it is typically smaller. A eukaryotic cell is larger, has membrane-bound organelles, and has a nucleus. So your eukaryotic cells are your things like plants and animal cells. We've seen those. Your prokaryotic cells, they don't have those organelles. And then both, they both have DNA, they both have cytoplasm, they both have ribosomes. And like I was saying, in order for it to be considered living, it needs to have a cell membrane. And there is a cell membrane. If you want to, I recommend that you go and you watch this um, Amoeba Sisters video. It's really fun. It's cute. And this unicellular, multicellular video, and then the levels of cellular organization here. So just watch those videos on this slide and they will help you understand this in a lot more detail and it will make a lot more sense. For slide three, you were just um, clicking and dragging the things that were here up to the correct place on this hierarchy. So it goes cells make up tissues, tissues make up organs, organs make up organ systems. And if you watch at the bottom of this slot of this site, this video will help you a lot in understanding that. So here's some examples of each of these. So an example of a cell, it's going to be your blood cells, your skin cells, you know, just what a cell, your, the types of cells. Examples of tissues are going to be your connective tissue, your epithelial, which is like your skin tissue, and your muscle tissue. So the things that help you move. The connective tissue is what's between your ligaments and your bones that help hold that together. The next thing is the organ. So tissues make up organs. And organs are things like your heart, your lungs, your stomach, your kidneys, your skin on the outside of your body is an organ. And organs make up organ systems. An example of an organ system is the respiratory system. Another uh, organ system is the immune system. There are multiple organs working together to make this system. So you need to know that cells make up tissues, tissues make up organs, and organs make up organ systems. So cells, tissues, organs, organ systems. For slide four, you clicked on the frog and it took you to this. And this is exactly the same as what you have to do. So you have to type in all of these words. So domain is the most, it's the biggest one. It's the most umbrella term. Oh, you can't you drag in each of them. I'm sorry. You don't have to type. You just drag them. Kingdom is the next one. We'll learn more about the different kingdoms. Um, the animal kingdom is an example of the kingdom. The plant kingdom, the fungi kingdom, things like that. Phylum, class, order, family, and then genus and species. So genus and species are what make up the names for your um, binomial nomenclature scientific name. And we'll go over that on the next slide. So a good way to remember this is Dear King Philip came over for great spaghetti. Or you could come up with something else that will help you remember how to keep these in order. But once again, the way I remember it is Dear King Philip came over for great spaghetti. For this one, you click on the frog and it takes you to taxonom 
the same thing that you saw earlier about the hierarchy of classification. So then you start talking about taxonomy. Taxonomy is the way that we classify anything. Scientists use taxonomy to classify and group different animal species. It's not limited to animals. You can go outside of animals. In science, we call that binomial nomenclature. Binomial nomenclature literally means two name, name. So bi means two, nomial means name, and nomenclature means name. So it is a two name name. And this is a two part system of naming animals using both the genus and the species. Carl Linnaeus came up with this. And so to put it simply, a cat, scientific name is Phyllis cactus. Um, you'll notice that on my slide, I have them italicized. They need to be italicized. That's important. It's Latin. The words are Latin. So, well, most of them are Latin, I should say. So, they need to be italicized because it's a, it's a language that isn't spoken anymore. So, Phyllis catus is your common household cat. Mungus, mungos, mungo is your mongoose, which that's what that is. And um, Ifeo, Ifeophagus hana or hana is your king cobra. So you do not need to know how to pronounce these names. You just need to know that if someone shows you the scientific name, you understand that the first part is the genus. And the second part is the species. Together, this makes up the whole species name. So if you just put caddis, that is not the species. The species name, the scientific name is Phyllis caddis. Okay. Like I said, you don't need to know how to pronounce these. You just need to understand that if I were to give you a scientific name, you could pull the parts apart. All right, slide six is about dichotomous keys. So what is a dichotomous key? Taxonomists have developed special guides known as dichotomous keys to aid in identifying unknown organisms. So dichotomous keys help you figure out what an organism is. And what are dichotomous keys used for? They help to determine organisms based on their different traits. So... Uh, watch this video here. It helps explain dichotomous keys a lot more, and it helps you work through one. But if we're going to go on to slide seven here, I'm not going to go through all of these answers with you, but I am going to go over the first two. So this uh, green-beaked bird and this white-beaked bird. So let's go ahead and click here on the toucan click key, and what you'll see is in this lesson, you will be classifying different subspecies of toucans. You'll be using a dichotomous key, which is a series of descriptive statements that have two possible responses. So when I go to the next slide, you're going to see the pictures of the toucans. You're going to click on the picture, and then it's going to give you two options, and you're going to choose which one best describes that toucan. So let's do the first one together. Like I said, I'm going to leave three, four, five, and six for you to do on your own. One and two, let's do. So I'm going to click on one. It's going to say bird number one. So I'm looking at this bird. Does its beak contain two colors or does its beak contain three or more colors? So it has one, two, three, four colors on its beak. So it has three or more colors. Then I'm still looking at bird one. Does it have a yellow belly or does it have a black belly? It's got a black belly. And does it have a long and round tail or is it a short and square tail? So it has a long and round tail. Oh, oh, it went away. What happened? Oh, no. Okay, give me one moment. Accidents happen. So just if you ever do that, that's a good way to show that mistakes can happen. Click on the home button at the bottom left, and it takes you back to this page. So click on toucan. 
bird one, or we're looking at this, remember, has three or more colors, it has a black belly, and it has a long and round tail. So bird one is the kill build toucan. So we're going to take kill build toucan, and we're just going to put it to the right of that. The next one we're going to look at is this one with the white beak. So once you figure out what this is, click on the home button again, and then go back to this. Click on the white beak toucan or bird number two, and you're going to see it has one, two, three colors. So you're going to click three or more, and does it have a yellow belly or a black belly? Its belly is yellow. And does it have a smooth head or a rippled or bumpy head? It's got some ripples in there. All right. So the answer is it is the curl crested aracari. The curl crested aracari. So just click and drag your option down to here, and you're going to do that for the rest of these. Like I said, I'm not going to give you the answers to these. I want you all to work through these by yourself. The economist keys are not difficult. Um, they do take some practice, though. So please practice. You have to look at the descriptions, and we're going to have more practice with this later in the quarter. For slide eight, you were to click on the frog. When you clicked on the frog, it took you to the differences between you care between you bacteria, archaea bacteria, and eukaryotic eukaryotes. So let's go over what those differences are. So you bacteria, you bacteria are prokaryotic. They are mostly they are all unicellular, and here are some characteristics of them. There are three basic shapes. They have a cell wall, and they have no membrane-bound organelles. Examples of this are cholera, tetanus, and tuberculosis. These are your everyday bacteria. These are your the bacteria that's in your gut. These are the bacteria that's um, on your food. These are your bacteria that are just everywhere. Your eukarya bacteria. I mean, archaea bacteria, so archaea bacteria. Archaea means like ancient. So archaea, ancient, archaea, old. Uh, prokaryotic, so they don't have membrane-bound organelles. They don't have a nucleus. They're unicellular. And they're found in extreme conditions. So they're found near, like, in really salty areas, in really hot areas, in areas where most other living things cannot live. They have no DNA. Instead, they have RNA. So here are some examples. Um, methane makers. So they make methane. They live in methane. Heat lovers. They love heat. And salt lovers, uh, where it's super salty. Next thing we have are eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are named eukaryotes because they are eukaryotic. So eukaryotes, eukaryotic. They have a nucleus. Eukaryotes can be both unicellular and multicellular, and they are composed of eukaryotic cells. They, um, they have a nucleus, and they have membrane-bound organelles. Examples are protists, fungi, plants, and animals. And we're going to be going over protists, fungi, plants, and animals in the next few slides. It's going to be what the rest of this notebook is about. All right, the first thing we're going to learn about are protists. So click on the frog, and what you'll see is it takes you to this. It gives you a, a little description, and then a video on slime mold and bioluminescent algae. Um, these are really fun. Bioluminescent algae glows. It's very cool. So watch these videos if you want some examples, some more examples of protists. So let's see. Protists are, in, are a eukaryotic cell, so they... Members of the kingdom can be unicellular and multicellular. They are both. They are both. There are some that are unicellular and some that are multicellular. Their cells do contain nucleus, the nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. So they do have that. All members of this kingdom can move. True or false? That is not true. All members of this kingdom cannot move. Um, that's just, you got to remember that. And species can both be autotrophic and heterotrophic. 
autotrophic, so auto means self, and trophic means like fed, so it means self-fed. Heterotrophic means other or different, so other fed, meaning that you have to eat something. So autotrophic are things like plants, and they make their own food. Heterotrophic, we're heterotrophic. We don't make our own food. So protists are both. And like I said, if you want to watch those videos, it will be fun for you, I promise. For fungi, so for slide 10, we're talking about fungi. Click on the little frog again. It takes you to talking about fungi and how mushrooms grow. Um, mushrooms are very interesting, um, the way that they grow and they work. So what do fungi, how do they obtain their nutrients? They break down and absorb nutrients from their surroundings. So they break down dead things um, or dying things, I should say. Sometimes it's not necessarily dead. They are dying. So um, if you see a mushroom outside, it's feeding off of something that is decaying in the ground. So what are three examples of fungi? Yeast, so the thing that makes your bread rise, that is a fungus. Molds, the things that you can see if you leave your, fo your food too long in the fridge or if you leave it out or something, mold starts to form. So that's an example of a fungi. And mushrooms. So if you see a mushroom outside, uh, Mario Kart has mushrooms, things like that. So yeah, yeast is the same yeast that you use um, in bread making. Last thing is, what is one thing you learned from the video? You have to watch this video to find out the answer. So watch this video. It's like, it's three minutes and 50 seconds, so almost four minutes. It is not very long. Just tell me one thing that you learned from this video. Slides 11 and 12 are going to go over together since they are both talking about plants. Um, so you, if you click on the frog here, there are three things about plants. There's the plants have cell walls and chloroplasts, plants make their own food, and plants have a cuticle. So that's what you need to type here. Plants have a cell wall and chloroplasts, so cell wall helps support it. Chloroplasts helps make the food. Plants make their own food. Uh, we'll talk about photosynthesis, like I said, uh, later. Don't worry about that yet. And plants have a cuticle. A cuticle is just the waxy stuff that's around it that helps protect it from losing too much water. The next thing we have is your types of plants. There are really two main types of plants. There are non-vascular, which means they have no pipes. They have no pipes. Um, Non-vasculars also have no seeds and no flowers. So these are the things like your mosses, your ferns, things like that. Your vascular plants, your vascular plants, which have pipes, they also can have seeds, but not always have seeds. And they can have flowers, but not always have flowers. Ferns and mosses, remember that fits underneath your non-vascular. That's going to be no pipes, no seeds, and no flowers. The next one is your gymnosperms. These are your non-flowering vascular plants. Non-flowering vascular plants. So these are things like um, uh, pine trees, things like that. Trees that don't have flowers. Grass, things that don't have flowers, but also have a vascular uh, system. And the last one we have are your angiosperms. So these are the only ones that have flowers. They are things like your dogwood trees, the trees that have flowers, your tulips. Your flowers, when you think of like pretty flowers, these are your angiosperms. So you do need to know the difference between non-vascular and vascular and that ferns, mosses, and what are these? What does it say? Sorry. Forget. Oh, horntails, um, angiosperms, and gymnosperms. You need to all know the difference between all of these.
Animals. We're starting on animals now. I'm going to go over slides 13 and 14 here because they're just talking about the broad idea of animals. So there are two main types of animals. There are invertebrates and there are vertebrates. Invertebrates do not have backbones. In means no. Vertebrate means like your vertebrae, your backbone. So these are animals without backbones. Vertebrates are animals with backbones. So we are vertebrates. We are vertebrates. Uh, bugs are invertebrates. We'll talk about more of invertebrates and vertebrates in the last few slides. On slide 14 are the different types of symmetry. The different types of symmetry. So here is it typed out talking about body plans. And here's the picture loading. And you'll see that the picture is kind of confusing. Um, but let's talk about it. So asymmetry or no symmetry means there's no line. You can't draw a line anywhere on this to cut it in half and the two sides be almost identical. So there's no line. A means not. Symmetry means both sides match. Next kind we have is bilateral. So if you were to cut, for lack of better words, if you were to cut this organism from its mouth all the way down to its anus, the two halves will be about the same. Sometimes your organisms are not perfectly bilateral, but an example is a dog is bilateral. We are bilateral. Um, most mammals and vertebrate, verte well, and vertebrates are bilateral. Next kind is radial. So you see that anywhere that I cut this, so the green line is one cut, yellow is another, the white, the pink, and the red. These are all, if I were to fold this starfish in half, those two halves would be the same for any of the thing, any of the cuts that are along these colored lines. Okay? So what that means is that it has radial symmetry. So it has multiple ways that you can cut it. And the parts are arranged in the circular, uh, arranged circular. So just think about here's the center and from there it 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 um Oh my gosh, it spirals out for lack of better words. It extends out from the center. So you need to know these types of symmetries. So I'm going to go through slide 15 by itself, but slides 15, 16, and 17 are all invertebrates. They're all animals, but they're all invertebrates. So here we have to start off with is the periphera. So these are your sponges. They have no symmetry. They have no heads, no nerves, no guts. They can move, but they're very slow. And their movement is very difficult to see. You would have to like put a camera up and like time lapse it for a long, long time to see it. So they do move, but it's very slow. Um, so, yeah, SpongeBob is actually an animal. Periphera are animals. They're very simple, but they're animals. The next thing we have are cnidarians. Cnidarian is a Latin for stinging cell. And if you remember that, remember that cnidarian means stinging cell, you'll remember that an example of a cnidarian is a jellyfish. So all cnidarians have stinging cells. Cnidarians have complex tissues. They have a gut for digesting, and they have a system as and have a nervous system. Cnidarians include hydras, jellyfish, sea anemones, and coral. Um, we might talk about sea anemones and clownfish when we start going over types of relationships. It's an interesting one. So sea anemones do sting most other fish, but since clownfish grow up and are born, you know, around it, they develop a mucus on the outside of their skin that helps protect them so they don't get stung. So, keep that in mind. It's a little fun information. So, yeah. So, periphera, 
periphera, say it with me, periphera are sponges. Think of like pores. Um, that's how I remember that one. Things that are pores are sponges. Uh, Nidarian, you just got to remember that one by stinging cells. And um, the Nidarians are jellyfish, sea anemone, coral. And yes, coral can sting you. They have stingers. So yeah, on to the next slide. For slide 16, we're talking about mollusk and worms. So mollusk includes snails, slugs, clams, oysters, squids, and octopuses or octopi. This is the second largest of all phylum of animals. Most mollusks live in the ocean, but some live in the fresh water. So yes, mollusk, they have some kind of shell on them. So a snail is an example. Um, and yes, cephalopods, which are octopi and squids, they have a shell on the inside of them. So that makes them mollusk. And what else about these guys? I think that's it. Yeah, some of them are bivalves, which just means two valves or two like shells. And those are going to be your clams and your oysters. But they are the second largest phylum in the animal kingdom. Worms are some of the simplest animals, yet some of the most important. Worms are decomposers, which means they break down substances in the soil. Worms are critical to returning nutrients back to the soil. Worms may be simple, but there are three different types of worms. So if you click on the frog and you click on worms, it tells you the three different types. There are flatworms. There are round worms, and there are segmented worms. So your segmented worms are your earthworms. Your round worms are mostly your parasites, so your... Um, oh my gosh, what are they called? Yeah, they're your parasites. I totally forgot the example of a parasite that's in your, that can get in your body. Totally forgot it. And then flatworms. These are really interesting because you can cut it. Like, so you see where my mouse is? If you cut it here, it will actually grow back two heads. So that's really interesting and fun. So there are worms and there are mollusks. So these are some more invertebrates in the animal kingdom. The last two invertebrates, they're going to be your arthropods and your echinoderms. So arthropods are a very diverse of species, of species. Some species are aquatic, while others are terrestrial, meaning some live in the water and some live on land. There are thousands of different types of arthropods on Earth. But one time, they looked very different from what they are now. So if you click on the frog and you click on arthropods you watch this video you'll see the age of giant insects so it talks about when insects used to be large here are some characteristics of arthropods they have jointed limbs segmented and specialized they have an ex an exoskeleton an exoskeleton which means they have if you were to step on this it would go crunch squish instead of squish crunch and they have a well-developed brain the next ones we have, oh, an example of this is like a spider or a crab or a lobster, things like that. Next thing we have are echinoderms. Echinoderm literally translates to spiky skin. Spiky skin. So derm, your epidermis is your, your, your top part of your skin. The echinoderm means spiky skin. And all echinoderms are marine animals. They include sea stars, sea urchins, sea lilies, sea cucumbers, brittle stars, and sand excuse me, sand dollars. Echinoderms have an endoskeleton or an internal skeleton. So they do not have an exoskeleton like arthropods. They have it on their insides. Um, starfish. 
are an example of econoderms. If you were to ever fill a starfish, it is spiky. And sea urchins are an example. They're really spiky. So literally, econoderm means spiky skin. All right, we're on the last slide, slide 18. So you, if you click on the frog, it takes you to vertebrates, warm and cold. You should watch this video, the difference between warm-blooded and cold-blooded. So if it is cold-blooded, it is said to be ectothermic, E-C-T-O, ecto, so C for cold, C for ecto. And then if it is warm-blooded, it is said to be endothermic. The only way to remember that is that it's not ectothermic. All right, then we're going to put, for each of these, so you're going to highlight this top three blue and the bottom three red. And for each of them, you're going to put three characteristics. So, first characteristics, fish. They're covered with scales, they breathe with gills, and they lay their eggs in water. So they spend their whole life in the water. Fish spend their whole life in the water. Amphibians. Their skin lacks scales, fur, and feathers. They can breathe with gills in the water and lungs on the land. So amphibians go through metamorphosis. So like tadpoles have gills, but frogs have lungs. So they go through a whole change. And frogs, or amphibians, sorry, lay eggs in the water. They have to lay their eggs in the water because... They can't have their eggs out on land or they will dry out. And the next one we have are reptiles. Reptiles have skin. Their skin has scales. They breathe with their lungs their whole life. And they lay eggs on the land. So think about sea turtles. Sea turtles have lungs. Sea turtles have lungs. They still have to get up and get air. They live in the water. But they still lay their eggs on land. They go to the beaches, they dig the holes, they lay their eggs, and then the baby turtles have to crawl back into the ocean from the beach to the ocean. So, reptiles still lay their eggs on land. Birds, their skin is covered in feathers. They breathe with their lungs, and they also lay their eggs on land. Birds also, um, a lot of them can fly, not all of them, but a lot of them. The last bit we have are mammals. Mammals have fur. Um, we have hair. It's not, you know, thick fur like you would think of when you think of like a cat or a bear. But we still have hair. We are mammals. We They breathe with lungs. So mammals breathe with lungs. And they produce milk or ex, um, secrete, sorry, milk from their mammary glands. So... All mammals produce some kind of milk from their mammary glands. And that is how it is a mammal. So if you were to click on the frog and you just scroll down a little bit, you see these typed out a little bit more. And you see that they're separated. The blue are ectothermic and the red are endothermic. All righty. Um, once you're done with this, please press submit on your assignment. There have been a lot of people that have not been doing that. Please do that. And thank you.